two cubs in a, in a particular year. And then uh, the inbreeding rate is the, the probability of inheriting two identical genes from a common ancestor. And the question really is, of course, uh, you're probably wondering why is this, this so important? Um, because here we're incorporating not just genetic information, but also demographic information about the population. And again, as I mentioned before, that's, that's a pretty unique data set that most people really don't have for any wildlife population. Um, it essentially helps us, uh, helps us understand the population's breeding potential. Um, effective population size is a good indicator of uh, future evolutionary potential uh, and long-term viability. And uh, it, it helps us determine at what rate genetic diversity might be lost in the future. And that relates to a concept called genetic drift. And uh, this is as much technical detail as, as I'm going to provide uh, before we switch to the graphs. So bear with me here. But suppose these are the, these different colors of blocks represent kind of the basic uh, building unit of, of, of genetics, of, of genes. Um, so let's say those represent alleles. Um, as you go to the next generations, in an isolated population, there's no new influx of, of, of alleles. So they're going to be lost over time, simply because you know, they might be, this red one might be passed on for a couple generations, but then will not be passed on to the next generation. And what you end up at, you know, after a number of generations is, is a lot less genetic diversity. That's basically the, the principle of this. What is really important is that that loss, the rate of loss, is much less if you have a large population versus really small populations. So the rate of loss when you have 10 individuals in this example is really high, whereas if you have 1,000 individuals, the rate of genetic loss is, uh, is much less. It will always be there um, because it's an isolated, if, as long as it's an isolated population. So our sample came from all over the, the ecosystem. Um, Again, we had data, demographic data, sex, birth year, death year, uh, and then we have the, the genotype information to go with it. And so we were actually able to reconstruct these cohorts and, uh, and population samples over time. So what we found was that we saw a f about fourfold increase in effective population size over this period um, from about a little bit before 1985 through uh, 2005. So that's the, the, the green line here. Um, which is which really kind of surprised us. Um, and what is important about this is there's um, Franklin in a classic paper established that for long term viability, it really needs a population, an effective population size that is close to, to 500. Now, effective population size, I haven't mentioned this yet, is always smaller than a census population size, than, than the actual population size based in, in our case on the Chow 2 estimate, for example. Um, because not all animals actually breed or contribute to the, the next generation. Yearlings, two-year-olds don't, don't breed, they don't contribute to the next generation, so they, they are not counted in, in the estimate of the effective population size. So what was, um, what was really encouraging was the fact that our Chow 2 estimate, the black line here, basically kind of followed the same pattern. It's a higher estimate, simply because, because of what I just mentioned. Um, but it's, it's certainly encouraging that uh, the effective population size essentially over that time period show a similar trend to the, 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 the trend that we've uh, documented based on the Chow 2 estimator, which, which we call the census population size. We also looked at the number of uh, breeding adults through different techniques. It doesn't matter really what's, what the difference is between these techniques. They basically show, again, the same pattern, increase in the number of breeding adults over that, uh, over that time period. We also see um, an increase in generation interval, so this population is aging. Our demographic data are telling us that. This genetic data um, basically shows us the same pattern, an, an increase in generation interval from, from 8 to 14 years. So just like you have with human populations, um, populations in Japan, for example, have a very different age structure and generation interval than, than some other populations where you have a lot of people that are reproducing. We also compared it to historic um, estimates of uh, effective population size. And um, this is based on some of the work by Miller and Bates uh, back in 2003. We reanalyzed their samples, uh, some of these historic samples, and this is our, our sample for the more recent time period. 
again, it supports the same notion based on different techniques that effective population size has increased uh, quite substantially from about 80 um, in the in that earlier time period to about 280 um, in the more recent time period. And then finally, what we've seen is if you look at genetic diversity, there's different ways of looking at that. Um, if you look at uh, allelic richness as a measure of, of genetic diversity, that red line, you really don't see much of a change uh, in that line. There's, there's no declining trend in that red line over time, over this time period of 1985 to 2010. There's a little bit of a decline in expected heterozygosity in our measure of, of genetic diversity. And uh, that essentially translates in, into a, a rate of inbreeding of 0.2%, which is really small. So, um, you know, to summarize the findings of, of this particular study, um, we, we saw about a fourfold increase in the effective population size of, of the Yellowstone grizzly bear population. Uh, temporal estimators uh, using uh, historical data uh, support that, that same trend. Uh, the number of breeders increased, generation interval increased, uh, genetic diversity has remained stable, and we have a very low rate of inbreeding. So there's a lot of really good news here in terms of the genetic concerns that were there about this population. Um, that those concerns based on this work uh, are really not, um, not grounded. Now finally, I'll give you a, a real single slide overview of, of this paper. Um, the reason is that we've presented some of these results already at, at previous meetings. Uh, this was part of the, the food synthesis report. Um, so I'm just going to, this was a paper that we published in Journal of Wildlife Management. And the summary uh, of these findings was that um, what we documented and what I've, what I've shown you is uh, the slowing of population growth um, since the early 2000s. We know that the proximate cause of that uh, is the lower survival of younger age classes. There's a little bit of reproductive suppression, but it's, it's pretty minor compared to uh, the lower survival of the younger age classes. The ultimate cause of that was linked to higher bear densities and not a change in food supply based on, on the change in white buck pine. So the white buck pine decline showed no relationship with the, the change in vital rates of lower survival of younger age classes. It was bear density that showed the strongest relationship. So we see this, this, this association of higher bear densities with lower survival of younger age classes and also with a, a little bit lower um, reproductive output. So there's a little bit of reproductive suppression related to densities as well. The potential density dependent drivers behind it um, may be interspecific killing, uh, which has been documented in, in other populations. Um, Sterling Middle was probably the, the first one to document that for populations in, in Alaska. Um, and it's not uncommon for populations that are reaching or getting near carrying capacity for these things to, to happen. There may also be some, some increased competition, but really most of our evidence um, and some anecdotal evidence is, is uh, pointing at intraspecific killing as the potential mechanism. And what I think, uh, what we point out in the paper, and what I think is an important point to remember is that you know, we're not just making this stuff up. You know, this, um, in terms of these patterns, um, this follows established paradigms that, that uh, people like Lee Eberhard uh, have established a long time ago. Um, that as populations reach carrying capacity, you see a certain sequence of change in terms of vital rates. And the first one to change is, as he indicated, is uh, survival of younger age classes. That's exactly what we're seeing. The next one is you see a little bit of, of, of reproductive suppression. That's what we're seeing. The last thing to change would be adult female survival probably. And indeed, we have not seen a change in adult female survival uh, for three decades. It's been 0.95 all those years. So this fits very well with, with established um, uh, paradigms in, in our field. So some, some of this, some people have referred to this as, as uh, voodoo science. Um, and I was going to try to do my best rendition of Jimi Hendrix's uh, voodoo child, but um, I'm not a very good guitar player, so I'm not going to do that. But I will, uh, I will use this quote to end up. Uh, and that is that, um, let's not confuse um, policy with science. We are a science team. Um, we have a long history. 
and I think our peer review publications speak for itself, so I'm not going to respond directly um, to some of those comments about who knew science, um, but let's make sure that that we don't don't get confused on policy and science. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge a lot of people that contributed to um, to our efforts this year and in previous years. Um, as you can see from the, the number of names on here, this is this is an incredible effort, including many people here in this room. And um, obviously, we, we could not do this work um, without all your support. And um, I appreciate that very much. And um, again, thank you, thank you very much for your attention. A uh, quick question: You showed the, the piece about your captures. I think there's about 90 variants this year that you, you captured. And it, it's been pretty constant on the number of new variants annually within that sample size. How does that correlate with the slowing population trend that we see? Does that correlate directly with that, or is it counter to? It, it is actually somewhat counter to. So that that might actually suggest since. Since a, a good number of captures were from from conflict captures on, that were more on the periphery, I would suggest that maybe, um, and it wouldn't surprise me if there's still more growth on the periphery than there is in the core of the ecosystem. You know, the density dependent effects first manifested itself, and then uh, the study team documented that a long time ago in, in the mono, in the wildlife monograph back in 2006. The, the core of the system, Yellowstone, was already experiencing signs of density dependence. That has now gone beyond that, that area, probably beyond the recovery zone. And the, the area of, of greatest uh, annual population growth might be more on the periphery now. So that's where there are uh, potentially new individuals that are kind of spilling out from the core of the ecosystem. Those are the ones that are entering more and more, or less and less suitable habitat. Those are the ones that also seem to get in trouble. So those, all that data still, I think, still, still jives. But I agree that that at, at, at first thought it is it is somewhat counterintuitive. Yeah. Because it, it, you know the, the population is aging. We've we've definitely demonstrated that. And um, at, at some point you you would think that that number would start um, declining a little bit. So we haven't seen. Which I think is, is very important. Along those lines, is there any evidence in the mortality pattern that suggests that one of the eventual possibilities is that it'll reach some kind of stability with regard to lower productivity in the core, greater productivity on the outside, simply because of the, the patterning of the human caused mortality around the group? Yeah, I mean, the, the there's got to be a limit, right, to, to how far this population um, can extend its range. Um, unless there's zero mortality, of course, then it, then it might keep going, uh, even though the, the habitat is, is less supportive. Um, but yeah, there, there, there's going to be, at some point, there's going to be um, a range extent, I would think, where, where the mortality due to the human factors is start evening out um, the expansion, so to speak, so that that at some point might might halt the expansion. Any other questions for Frank? Five-year plan that was handed out 
that are sitting in our table. Um, beginning the appendix A was changed. Um, so I'm page A. That's under the, the all systems piece. So that was that was changed and then they that I guess brought up another question for me, which is when stuff gets changed, how do we first of all make sure everybody knows it and then you know we agree or don't agree on that. So so this one pertains to the um, the previous version talked about we would need to evaluate and, and modify the recovery plan. And I think it had a 2012 date, so obviously that didn't happen. So this this got changed to say change the date, but then it has quite a bit of wording about the NCDE. At least the way I read it, I, I read that as almost threatening that you know, we didn't we didn't address this thing, but now if you want us to, you're going to delay or delisting of the NCDE for for three or more years, which which I don't appreciate that. I guess it's I don't think that's appropriate in this. It's not a work plan item, it's a report on a work plan. And so, I guess, so two things. One is, what's the process when it gets changed? Um, and then the other is, this specific change, you know, I don't agree with, and I suggest it not be in there. And then the, yeah, the other part then is, with regard to the ecosystem, so, so this document contains, um, as well, changes, at least in the Silver County Act ecosystem um, work plan that we were supposed to, that we directed them to do. Um, and, and are we, I guess I just wanted the status of this. Have we, are we going to approve it? Are we letting it languish until we meet again? Are we going to talk about it tomorrow? Or what's the status? So, so I think we we're not in a position to approve it based on the conversation we had earlier where we were talking about making some changes. Thank um, thanks again for bringing this up. Um, so my take on it, the reason I didn't ask for a vote to approve it is because I felt we weren't ready to approve it. That we had talked about making various changes to our charter and how we're going to do things and process oriented, so it seemed like we're not in a position to approve this. However, the point about um, who decides what's in this is a, is a very good point, and, and I think we should have some conversations about that. But also, I think that's something that uh, should be sent to Ellen as a topic point for this new charter thing that's going to be developed as to who decides what's going to be, who decides, who makes the decisions, I guess. So um, that's kind of my thinking where I didn't ask for a decision, and any other thoughts from anybody else? Hey, I just have to stop. So, Ken, I was just wondering, and I just, I just need to ask this. So, have you thought about maybe sitting on the committee that we just put together? Because it seems like then, I mean, I'm just saying this, that you would have a really good opportunity to really make sure that all these things that you are concerned about, that you guys move through, and that we could actually get some finalization of this plan. I mean, I'm just throwing it out. So <laughs> that committee, as I understand it, is, um, is going to talk about a charter or a subcommittee. Yeah, well, yeah. The charter, charter for us and IGBC and the NYU. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and, and Ed's got that covered. He made sure I was going to coordinate. <laughs> but, but again, my, my question is, is, so here's this document. It's got December 3rd from the top. What's the status of this one versus the, the version that preceded it? Um, um, we would go away and say this this one could be continued. Well, at the very top it does say the draft and the TLS is updated. So, right. so whatever previous version is what that would that we would still be using. So I think Ken has a really good point is that you know we you know we I mean we need to address that about if we're gonna update this plan, how do we how do we go about doing that? Because I also had other concerns in here this was from all ecosystem, but it talked a lot about the um, NCDE, but then from the NCDE, you know, uh, they, none of it was in here. 
that the stuff would happen there but it wouldn't happen over here. So it, it just needs to work on it. So it's my understanding we're cabling this right. until we get through the charter thing and everything, and then we're gonna bring it back up and, and then reapply and use our new process to address this. Right, we even talked about a different template, I mean, a different look, I mean, just the whole thing. So, but the difference between this one, the revision, is what you guys just talked about. The sub the perks and the cabin gap were split out um, in their in their action items. And then Chris worked with the committee to do that. And then the other update was the all ecosystems that we directed Chris to work on. And that's what that and I was asked to put that before to revise this particular all ecosystem section because it dealt with fish and wildlife service and the review of the recovery plan. But it was to go to the IGDC for review, evaluation, approval, amendment, whatever it was. It was a draft for review. So that's what I was asked to do at the summer meeting. So that's what this is here. But we're still not ready to approve it based on the discussion that we had this morning. Does anybody think otherwise? Clarifying <laughs> question, perhaps. Um, it, it, maybe it's because I'm new here. So we were asked to revise the five-day plans. There was no additional input. And so the subcommittee did just that. We had extensive conversation with them. What uh, the agencies felt were important actions to take and it was a oh, but I, I initiated that yeah. and that was at the request of the IPPC at the June meeting and a particular issue that came up at the June meeting was that the IPPC wanted to know why or if the Cabinet Act Self-Work Subcommittee would start a conservation strategy and that's the particular item that I suggested that you guys discuss and then what you did is you went on and you revised the whole fighting plan at your subcommittee meeting. That's what I understood. I was not there at that meeting. Yeah. I was the else on the subcommittee meeting at the same time. So, so we did revise that at us when we were instructed. And so if we are on a pause for an extensive period of time, then I'm not a child. It might need to go forward. <laughs> Okay, we're working on things with uh, some renewed interest in it. And so I would understand some process things that would be kind of important right now. Okay. Help me with what to do. What's the man? So that would be your second. That's a good question. And that gets to that thing we talked about this morning, that delegation of authority by the committee to the main the executive committee to these subcommittees or do you want to be in there every everything they do and approving everything they do? which one is it that the executive committee wants and that's something i think that we ended up this morning that we need a better understanding of what the objective of this, the main committee is do they want to do that or do they want to delegate authority and say to the Cabinet Act Software Subcommittee advise and update the work plan so that you're working on those things to get the recovery. And I think that was left unsaid is that this morning is that which you see who we're going to work on and thus we're working on this amendment of the charter and then further discussions and review of this. If there's an issue, it sounds like there's an issue with Subcommittee Act, what do you that is? So that I could either that means or something. I have a question. And so that this one, your your new work plan talks about start a or evaluate a conservation strategy for the water bowl. No. I believe it says begin having a conversation around what it would take and what does it look like. How is it working with the other other Yeah, so, so it says begin begin discussions concerning the content mechanism of the conservation strategy for Marco. Mm -hmm. And so the, the first thing I ran into based on our experience at Yellowstone and NCDE is what's the status of the recovery plan? Um, because the, the conservation strategy 
GDs, at least for the other GD based histories, are your post delisting management plans essentially. And, and the reason we've been having so much trouble with them is because we're also revising the recovery plans at the same time. And I guess my recommendation would be since we're so far out from recovery of this ecosystem, um, at least based on the current recovery plan, is let's make sure the recovery plan is is up to date and we know what the end zone is before we start writing a, a conservation strategy or a, or a post delisting management plan uh, so that, that the people in the communities that the agencies know what it is we're striving for and the assessment is that the 1993 recovery plan is perfect then then go for it but i would to me a look at the recovery plan and what for that ecosystem or those ecosystems and, and, and making sure that's up to snuff is step one before we embark on conservation strategy. So that's the stuff that you just had. Where does it fit and how does it go is exactly what this is saying we want to start doing. Is having that conversation, not just put on tasks to get us towards recovery, but have the conversation about what the recovery plan says, how are we going to get there, what does it look like we're going to do. I don't think, my impression is, these two ecosystems have not had that deep dive in discussion. We've been focused on uh, garbage and other things. Okay. So, to go from task base to something a little more strategic is exactly the conversation that you wanted to describe. Probably doesn't help you too much, and I understand what you're saying. Well, conservation strategy is a big red flag for me and, and for my people working on it because in the last seven or eight years we've had this argument that if you look at if you look at the IGPC's objective, one of our objectives is revise the recovery plan, not change the recovery plan for the for the range. And we're doing it piecemeal, you know, in part because of timing, in part because of where the different populations are. But with this particular area, there's no big rush, so, so why not make sure the recovery plan, and maybe so this is semantics, but make sure the recovery plan is, is good before we embark on this conservation strategy that should be to implement the recovery plan. And at least, at least understand what the recovery goals are, what's the end zone, and if I, if I understand right, that was a request from the Consortium of local governments and, and other entities as well, so there's a desire to see that. Yes. Um, there's a desire to have a conversation about what that looks like. And absent input from the parent committee, this is what we came up with. Start having that discussion. Because we're not hearing it. Well, it seems like, Mary, that's the discussion that needs to be happening. So that we can get to an end point to then move forward to what Ken's talking about. It. I follow what everything here. That's right. Mm -hmm. I agree. Absent the effort to have that conversation in the bigger group, the self protected act of partners on mm -hmm. that. I think I'm wrong. And the whole committee, you know, for over there again, but you know, there, there are two county commissioners on that. So they're already done. Yeah. 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 So, so tell me, is the recovery plan, the 1993 recovery plan, and the objectives for the Selkirk County Act, the recovery goals for the Selkirk County Act, are they good? Is that the end zone if we did that? We're there? And if not, I would say, First, we need to look at the recovery plan. And, and maybe, maybe the work plan, you know, we change, evaluate, doing a conservation strategy to evaluate, modify, modify the recovery plan. Do you have to marry that in or be in the mayor? I don't know. Because the conversation with the group of people that do know and the group of people that don't know, that's the conversation that we need. And that, 
that's the point. The big lead. starts to shift to the other ecosystem. That's exactly what we're beginning to talk about. Mm -hmm. Ken, does that kind of answer your thoughts? Well, it answers. I, I, I understand where, where they are in that. I guess from the IGBC perspective, you know, we, have, we have our work plan. Our work plan says the recovery plan needs to be looked at and revised and updated in contemporary fine. And, and I think I, I, I firmly believe that's important so that as they're evaluating you know, where they're going, they know where they need to go. So how do you know where you need to go if you have a, a recovery plan that, that isn't relevant? And, and I believe it's not relevant. Nobody ever talks about it. But I can tell you, I can tell you when, when the big push for the DNA study happened, it was all, if we get to 100 mayors, we're there. I mean, that was your county commissioners, your, your state legislators, and that. So you get to 100 mayors and they have it yet, um, is, is recovery, then we're good to go. Um, if, if it's now 500 mayors or it's something totally different, then you should know what that is. Know where we need to get. Well, in terms of numbers, again, it's not even different. The 100 bears are still the same, and the recovery and the self is still the same. We don't have any basis to change those numbers because the recovery zone size dedicates how many bears we can have there. The other issues are there. We need regulatory mechanisms. We need habitat standards. Those things still are underway, and those are necessary for recovery too. But that number of 100 bears is not somehow being invalidated or, or different. And the point of this, this all ecosystems comment at the bottom is that opening the recovery plan up in a general way to review and rewrite is not a trivial matter. And, 
what I'm laying out there is exactly what is needed to consider the cost benefits of opening the recovery plan. Because if we do open the recovery plan, it's going to be a long process. It's going to be subject to litigation. It's going to tangle up a lot of ongoing processes that are dependent on the existing recovery plan. Is that beneficial to us to do that? Do we need to evaluate the recovery plan and change it? Is that going to, is that going to be a, is the cost going to override the benefits? Or is the benefits going to override the cost? And what's laid out there is that a group of people would do cost benefit now. Not me, a group of people would decide that. And you no, know, I have a view on it, but I think maybe other people in the community the executive committee should evaluate that. But we were litigated on the 93 recovery plan and went through a lot to get it finally settled, and it was a huge deal. Mm -hmm. And anytime you get litigated on a federal document, it's years and years to go through that process. And the cost benefit of doing that and opening that up, is that something that's going to gain us something? That needs to be carefully considered before we start that process. And we can't even get to that point until we know what we're hearing from the to see. Well, I think the, the evaluation of the recovery plan is, you know, we would need to think about the habitat standards and the demographic standards, those 100 numbers or whatever the number is, is that a still reasonable? Right. The regulatory mechanisms, we have to make big progress in that, that's the conservation strategy, but those details are all laid out in the existing plan. Those things mm -hmm. need to be attained and achieved, and you know, we're moving forward in the process of the cabinet act and so forth, both of which have come a long way. <coughs> they're, they're a lot farther ahead than they were 20 years ago on the existing records. And I hope you're more from the main models of what some of the other